Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who will, I, who will I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, Lord, send me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It was a transitional year. The king had died, King Uzziah. And with his death, there was a transfer of political power and all of the uncertainty that goes with it. There were economic challenges to this small nation of Judea and Israel and uncertainty about the constant fear of invasion from foreign powers. These great foreign powers were known to enter vulnerable nations and attack them and with torturous methods destroy them. It was Isaiah's turn to enter the Holy of Holies. He had prepared himself ritually, he had prepared himself academically. He had lived with the covenant practices faithfully and he certainly knew the Torah, the scripture, on that day when he entered the presence of God. But when he came into the presence of God, when at the altar of the temple in Jerusalem, he suddenly realized he was in the presence of the throne of God in heaven, Isaiah, with all of his preparations, was undone and begged for mercy. Woe is me, my lips are not clean, and the mouths of the people are not clean. Woe is me. There's a psychological paradigm that's very helpful in thinking in terms of goals for our lives at each stage of our development. The last of these developmental stages is characterized by either despair or integrity. Our story about Isaiah today is the story of a mature religious man who suddenly confronts God in the temple and falls into despair. Woe is me. In his vision, one of the creatures who were attending God in God's heavenly court, a seraph, took a coal from the, uh, from the altar and touched Isaiah's lips so that they were clean. With that, he was able to move from despair to integrity. He got his act together. To integrate something is to unify it or to consolidate it, to get it together. A person of integrity is one who has it together. In spiritual terms, integrity does not mean that we all understand all things intellectually or that we have achieved moral purity. It means that we, like Isaiah, have been in the presence of God and recognize our need for God's grace and that God's love means that that grace is available. The fact that we are truly loved, the fact that we are beloved of God, truly constitutes us as self. That is what helps us to get it together, not what we think. Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. But faith tells us, I am beloved of God, therefore I am. My identity is in relationship. That's integrity. And from this spiritual integrity comes hope. Hope is not having all the answers. It is experiencing the love of God. After Isaiah's lips were spiritually cauterized, he was able to speak, and when he spoke, he said, Here am I, send me. We see here a progression of the life and the life of the prophet that we must emulate. He started with ritual practice and instruction. In that order, he started with ritual practice and then instruction. They brought him to the temple a long time before they started teaching him what it meant. 
Sunday after Sunday, the Trinitarian formula shows up in our liturgy, in the music, in the creeds. Sunday after Sunday, we pass the font and dip our fingers into the vestal water and bless ourselves as we remember our baptisms. Sunday after Sunday, we come to the table and receive a little bread and a little wine and, and the call to hear someone say the body and blood of Jesus. All of that happens long before we learn what it means. We experience grace as Isaiah did when through the Holy Spirit we are translated from this beautiful space to the beautiful space. From the Lord's table to the Lord's table where the banquet of the Lord is served with all his saints, with all the heavenly attendants, and where we participate in that beautiful, eternal banquet. In recovery, hope is born when a person who has first admitted to being powerless over the object of his or her addiction starts to believe that there is a power sufficient to help and a power that will help. When we move from the recognition of our own powerlessness over evil to faith in God and Christ, that begins the final assault on evil, we have hope. Remember Paul's threefold summary of the gifts of the Spirit? Faith, hope, and love abide, but the greatest of these is love. That applies here. Faith, also a gift, brings hope, which frees us to love. If integrity is the opposite of, of despair, then having it all together spiritually means that we have hope. Not all the answers, but hope. Isaiah went from despair to eager will willingness to speak for God. He had not lost hope when he entered the temple. He had never really known what hope was. He had, the, the, he had been optimistic, but that is not hope as we're talking about it spiritually. We get those things confused, optimism and hope. I learned the difference between optimism and hope from a woman I met in a hospital in Texas. She wanted to go home for Christmas. She wanted to be with her little two-year-old grandchild. The nature of her condition meant that it was incredibly dangerous to move her. To live, to continue to live, she had to lie flat in the bed. Jostling her from her bed to a gurney, to an ambulance, and then the ride on the ambulance and transporting her into her home was very risky. A wrong move and she would die. And my job was to document that she knew the risk so that when she signed the content, the consents to be transferred, we would have documentation that she had been properly informed of the benefits and burdens of her decision. We routinely got documents signed that had the words inform consent at the top. But in this case, it took on special significance. As I stood at her bedside discussing with her the implication of her decision to be moved from that flat bed to her home, I came to appreciate this woman's faith. She was perfectly aware intellectually of her condition and the dangers associated with moving her, but she wanted to go home to be with her granddaughter, to be home for Christmas. She understood the clinical terms like irreversible condition, but more than once in our conversation, she said to me, I could get my miracle. I could get my miracle. She could be healed. The nurses and the social workers with whom I work 
thought that she was in denial. But I said not. She had hope. That's not foolish optimism. It is a spiritual condition, a gift of God, faith, hope, love. She was not expecting God to heal her, but apparently she had experienced what Isaiah experienced in the temple, what we experience with Holy Communion. She had been in the presence of the wonderful and mysterious God who loves us. She had it together. She had spiritual integrity. She was not in despair. She had hope. Today is Trinity Sunday, and what does a preacher say on Trinity Sunday? Do I try to explain the Trinity with similes like a three-leaf clover? Do I try to be clever? One plus one plus one equals one. No, that's all inadequate. Do I say that it's a great mystery and shrug my shoulders and be done with it? No. We need to understand why we believe God is both one and three. On top of that, we find ourselves today, as Isaiah found himself, in the midst of political turmoil and an ever-present threat from abroad. And we are in the time of transition within the church. All I'm going to say is that the Trinity is about perfection. Jesus perfectly loved the Father and through the Holy Spirit invites us into that perfect communion. As to political turmoil, we're above it. Do not forget in the months to come that we are above it. As to threats from evil, we must pray for deliverance from evil and we must pray that we would be able to forgive those who trespass against us as we have been forgiven. As to transition in the church, I am both optimistic and hopeful. I saw a very articulate man yesterday, escorted from the midst of the congregation to the altar of the great nave of the cathedral to receive congratulations and ovation from the council. He stood there with a look that I can't really describe. My prayer for our next bishop and my prayer for each of you is that confronted with the holiness of God, there will be a moment of despair. <clears throat> Woe is me. And growing out of that moment of desperation will be a lifetime of ministry. Here I am. Send me. A moment of despair, followed by a lifetime of ministry, informed not by foolish optimism, but perfect communion. The gifts of the Spirit of God summed up for us as faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love.